Welcome to The Recovering Perfectionist, where you'll learn all the hacks you need to get started and finished on your business or project. You'll connect with successful entrepreneurs who are in perfectionist rehab, unapologetically experimenting and balancing life, business, family, and me time. I'm your host and Chief Recovering Perfectionist, Claire Barton. Hi, it's Claire. Welcome to The Recovering Perfectionist today. I'm speaking with Katie Wyatt, who is affectionately known to me and many other people as the pod mama and pod queen. Um, Katie Wyatt is very, very integral in the reason and the process that got me into podcasting in the first place. So, of course, she has a very, very special place in my heart. Um, I first knew of Katie oh, a couple of years ago and I followed her very closely from the start of my business journey. Um, and I did her online course called Podwell, which is all about how to get started in a podcast and um, get yourself set up as a podcaster. So can't recommend that course highly enough. And Katie is an absolute wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things podcasting. Um, she's also a really, really clever business person. So we talk about that and um, lots of other things. And I've also been on her podcast, which I'll put links to um, that in the show notes as well. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a live coaching call with her on her podcast. So we talked all about a lot of things, business and podcasting, um, as it pertains to me and my business. So check that out as well. I uh, hope you enjoy the episode and I will talk to you really soon. Bye. Hi, everybody. It's Claire and I'm here with the gorgeous Katie Wyatt, who's the podcast queen, podcast mama, podcast legend. How are you going, Katie? I'm so good, Claire. How are you? I'm great. It's so wonderful to have you. And we've also been chatting this morning for an episode for your lovely podcast. So I'm stocking up on my Katie time today. I know, right? Such a treat. <laughs> um, Katie, before we go any further, a lot of people probably, um, to a lot of people, Katie White is hopefully and probably a household name, but tell us a bit about you and your business and what you do and all things Katie Wyatt. Yeah, there'd be some funny households where I'm a household <laughs> name. But thank you so much for having me on your show and for being on my show not even two hours ago. Yay. But look, I, you know, Podcast Queen is kind of my tongue-in-cheek description of who I am and what I do in my business right now. But of course, I'm much bigger than just my business. Um, I, my business is a side hustle. So I also balance a job that I love with a family that keeps me very busy. Um, but they're all, well, not all, the, the job and the business are quite related. They're both in the business and helping businesses grow and start field. So that's where my business started, was really business coaching. And I started podcasting very early on that journey. It's like oh, about two and a half years ago now, which makes me feel like a pensioner in podcasting world. <laughs> Um, and I just love the platform. I love it. Like I love what I love being a listener of podcasts. I love teaching people about the power that podcasting has. It's like it just is insane to me. And so that's really the direction my business has gone in over the past year. I have a course for podcasters. I have a membership community. Um, you know both of those mm -hmm. well. And I coach, I coach entrepreneurs who want to use the podcasting platform. So I do provide business coaching as well as podcasting coaching. But the two go hand in hand as mm. far as I'm concerned. So that's really my business at the moment. Absolutely. I absolutely love it. And I have followed you since, well, pretty much since the beginning of my um entrepreneurial journey uh, there was you and probably four or five other people who were definitely some of the first who were I guess referred to me as you know watch these people and do what they do because they are successful entrepreneurs who are blending their family and their life and they're very authentic and all of that sort of thing so um, you and I, I I feel like I know you pretty well and we did some work together um, very early on so I know a little bit about your business and I talk about you a lot for fair, so many different reasons and obviously two of those is Podwell and the podcasting and that sort of thing because without you I wouldn't have a podcast. Um, I really love doing the Podwell course and I love being part of the podcast empire so that I can continue to tap into that um, incredible brain that you have and access your amazing coaching and your very holistic business 
um, approach to everything. So that's the first way um, or the first thing that I talk about. And the second thing that I often talk about is when I'm talking to people in my one-on-one coaching about um, getting over the startup paralysis that people kind of get into like I have to have a website I have to have a logo I have to have a style guide I have to have a Facebook page I have to have blah 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 there's like a list of 50 things that people think they have to have before they can even tell anyone that they've got a business or anything like that and one thing that um, I often refer about you is well I worked with this woman like a year and a half ago and she'd been in business for a few years and she still didn't have um, a logo or a certain set of colors or anything like that and she was really successful and no one really gave, gave a shit that she didn't have some flashy logo that she paid $700 for. Like, it's not a thing. You don't need to have all of these um, kind of bits and pieces totally perfect to get started and start making money and start building a profile for yourself. So mm. that's exactly what we're here to talk about today is doing it your way and um, not having to have everything completely figured out or completely perfect before you get started. So I'll maybe, well, maybe we'll start about talking about that sort of thing. Like how did you kind of get to the point where you were okay with, um, um, you know, making money through your business and putting yourself out there as an entrepreneur without having some of those things that were mm. in place already? Look, I, um, <laughs> I still don't have a logo. <laughs> That's the way to do it. The longer I go without one, the more I'm like, yeah, of course I'd love somebody with expertise to make my stuff look pretty, um, but it's so not essential. But you know what? Every lesson I've had here, I've learned the hard way. So mm. before I had my business, I launched a, another business, which was a product-based business. It was called The Superfoodery. Mm -hmm. and it was selling superfoods um, online. And before I started that business, I spent a lot of money paying someone to build me a Shopify website. I paid someone on, I think I did Design Crowd for, you know, the yeah. crowdsourced logo design. I got stickers and business cards and, you know, all this stuff. And look, with a product-based business, you kind of need a lot of that stuff. Right. You need a platform to sell and you need stock and all of those things. But I definitely over-invested considering I got about six months into the business and went, yeah, I don't really like product-based business model. It <laughs> kind of sucks having to come home and pack boxes and then get them to the post office. Yeah. Whereas before I'd started, I was like, oh, how cool would it be to just come home at night and pack boxes? <laughs> it's like, duh. Yep. So, yeah, uh, you know, I had to learn it the hard way. So then... I was like, well, I've spent all this money that I haven't made back and I can see I want to shift in this direction, but I can't justify spending all that money again. So I have had to start small. So mm. I literally, I think, bought a theme off WordPress and created the Wellness Entrepreneur, which was the original name. Now it's just Katie Wyatt. But, um, you know, I just did that myself and it was ugly as sin, but... I didn't have anyone looking at it. So it didn't right. even matter anyway. Yeah. Um, and then I started my podcast because, and I really had no business. I started my podcast because I just felt really called to do it. And I followed that kind of intuition, that gut feeling. And so I've done things all out of order mm. um, and it hasn't hurt me. You know, every time things do hurt me when I learn the hard lessons, it's usually because I am following a formula. Like I'm, I love formulas. Like, you know, I'm a massive fan of say Amy Porterfield because she, she learns something and turns it into a formula. Mm -hmm. And that's how she's built her business is mm -hmm. selling that, those formulas. And I follow her. I implement a lot of the stuff that she does. But what I've learned over the years is actually, <laughs> it doesn't work for me the way it works for Amy. Um, because I don't have a massive Facebook ads budget behind me. Um, <laughs> but when I do things a bit more comfortably that fit into my life and my way, then it just tends to work a bit better. And mm. that's been that's been like a two and a half year realisation. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the process. And I think, um, like I said, it's a, it's a process that you just have to kind of go through. Like I spent a lot of the beginning of my business journey going, um, you know, uh, observing these massive highs and massive lows and going, oh, 
this is awesome. I've totally won this week. This is amazing. That's working. That's great. And then something would always happen to either physically ground me. Like I felt like every time I had a high, I would fall over or I'd trip over or something like physically that the universe was like, hang on a minute, come back down here. But also energetically that something else would go wrong. And then you'd be like, oh, what am I doing this for? I'm just going to go and get a job. This is bullshit. I'm bored. I hate this, whatever. And then followed by that is another big high and then another big low. And at the start, observing those highs and lows was really kind of getting me down. I was like, why can't I just have, you know, why can't I just balance out? I don't want these real highs and real lows. I know, I know it's not going to be all smooth sailing and that sort of thing, but it was really getting me down until I realized after every high, uh, there is a low and after every low, there is a high and that's just part of the process and that's okay. And then you kind of be able to stay, um, take a step back and observe that that's what's happening and kind of just get comfortable with it and be like, okay, I'll just, you know, keep doing some of the strategies that I've learned to get off this kind of roller coaster a little bit. Mm. Um, but it's a process. Like I think it's all well and good to say, oh, just skip all that and go straight to here. It's no, there's no point. Like everyone's kind of got to go through those experimentation and, and trying things out and all of that sort of thing to get okay with it at the end. Mm, totally. And I think when we're starting out, you know, and you mentioned the starting point, and I think every time I see people in Facebook groups going, oh, I'm, you know, I'm new to this group and I'm about to launch my business and I've built my website and I've got a logo and will you vote on my logo? <laughs> and I just like, you know, I want to put my head in my hand. Mm. If you just want to shake them and say, oh, please don't spend money on that. Like yeah. get a client first or, yeah. you know, just kind of test, get out there and test what you're trying to do first. But you're right. We all go through it. And I think what makes a huge impact is where we get advice in those mm. formative, you know, I think that first year of business <clears throat> is hugely um we're so influenced because we're jumping into this pond we've never swum in and we're being get all these messages, all this conversation that we never even knew existed. Yeah. We're kind of like, oh my God, I'm like, it's like a candy store, all of these <laughs> services and people and groups and all this stuff. And then it's like, oh my God, now what do I do? Like they're saying do this and they're saying do this. And so I do think, um, a lot of it was a bit of luck. Like I had a lot of bad advice in my first year that I paid a lot of money for <laughs> and I had a lot of good advice as well um, that I paid money for. Not quite as much as I happened to pay for the bad advice. Well, but, you know, <laughs> these are the lessons. Yes. So I just think um, nobody, I don't think there's anybody that's still in business after two years that doesn't have an origin story that's like yeah. I paid for something really crap but I learned more from that than anything else I've paid for yeah 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 and I think it's um it's something again I, the, for me that happened in the first year was that I kept especially towards the end of the first year that I kept meeting people or doing work with people and thinking oh I wish I had spoken to you when I first started my business like I wish we'd done this work a year ago or two years ago. Or whatever. Yeah. But then on reflection, it would have been completely pointless doing that at the beginning because I didn't have, I like my business was so different, is so different now to what I thought it was going to be. So if I'd spent money on branding and marketing and client journey and stuff, like as I was starting or before I even launched my business, it would have been totally wasted anyway, because I would have been sending people on a track that I wasn't even going to end up on. Yeah. You know what I mean? so it's well, you don't about, know what you don't know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And it's the same, I, th I think, with your branding and, and all that sort of thing. Like when I started out, I thought I wanted to be a VA. I did that for a few months and realized that it was just not for me. It wasn't, it wasn't quite what I was after. But it took lots of different iterations. And I think until probably two months ago, every time I talked to someone and introduced myself, I was using some sort of different title and different tagline and I had a different target audience and I had a different process and you know it's all been about kind of refining that but if I'd spent all the money on getting someone to do all of my website copy or setting up a really beautiful you know, flash website and that sort of thing it would have been completely wasted because six months down the track I would have been like oh actually I don't do that anymore and I don't use those words and I don't work with those people so mm -hmm. it's kind of like it's kind of in my opinion it's imperative to just start and just have some form of experimentation if you've got a list of 20 things you want to try just start trying one it doesn't necessarily need to be finessed and beautiful 
Um, people are completely okay with, most people I think are completely okay with you saying, I'm trying this out. Anyone want to have a go with me? Mm. You're like, yeah, great. I'll give that a go. You don't need to be the doyen of whatever it is to get people to kind of come along on the journey with you and to um, be the recipients of your testing. Mm, totally. I think business is an experiment and we just have to treat it that way, mm. um, especially in the early years. But always, always it's everything we try is just, a, you know, we're just throwing another line in, like see what happens. Um, yeah. But I also think part of that is is the reason we have those big highs and lows because we are trying new things constantly it's kind of like, oh, my God, that worked. And, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And that failed miserably. And I found over probably the past six months, I got really, really clear on my business model for probably the first, well, for the first time in my entire business. And I narrowed in and I niched in. And, you know, even to more recently, like deciding to give up my bigger and more successful Facebook group of the two that I run was a decision made from well I have to I've started this simplification process I have to follow it through and really you know make give it the respect that the decision deserves and I actually feel like that is giving me that leveling out that Mm. I'm not so on the ups and downs because I've made really conscious decisions about what works with my life Mm. what works with the time I have available what works with the strategy I've made going forward And often I think, you know, I spent months last year going, oh, I'm just waiting for clarity so that I can make a decision. (laughs) I don't know if anyone can relate to that one. (laughs) No, no one one did that. No one waits for clarity. And no, exactly. (laughs) And what I realized is it's it's exactly what you said. It's like it's you make the decision and then you get clarity. Mm. It's pick one thing off the list then everything will become clear. Yeah. Like it's the it's the waiting for the inspiration to strike you and somebody to go, oh, this is the right decision. Mm. That never happens. You've got to make it. But once you do, everything will become really clear. Mm. And it can be one of the, I guess, scariest things is to kind of start saying no to some of the things, like you said, that have been working. Um, and, you know, oh, God, yeah. I'd love to talk a bit more about your groups because I know that's been a really big um, shift in the last month or so. Um, and I, I feel like the same sort of thing has happened with me in the last couple of months. Like towards the la- end of last year, there was a specific kind of service that I'd been offering all year long and it definitely um, taught me a lot. It gave me some great um, exposure and some great experience and I learnt so much about me and my business and my process and my model, but also about a heap of systems and tools and other people's business models and that sort of thing that I wouldn't have otherwise had. But it was never the place that I was going ideally. So I thought I'll do it for another year or something. And then it kind of all came to a halt at the beginning of this year. And I was like, yep, actually it needs to stop now. And it was really scary because that was where a lot of my um, uh, base income sort of thing was coming from. And it was kind of scary going, oh, I'm, I need to get rid of this because I need to make space for all my, my plans and the things that do feel right. But it's scary because I, I haven't quite got this all nutted out and this is where my income's coming from. So ooh, what am I really doing? But once I'd done it, I just felt this huge like, ah, oh, yes, that's the right thing to do. It is a bit scary still, but it's also a really great nudge and like the last bit of the motivational kind of push to do the things that I know I want to be spending my time and my effort, my energy um, on creating and on serving people because it's actually a better product anyway. Mm. So it is scary, but sometimes it's just one of those sort of risks and experimentations that you've got to mm. take the plunge with. Yeah, and I think what you've described, like the fear is all in the decision. It's like it's all about committing. Mm. And then the minute you do, it's so much more relieving than all the worry. Like I've spent months worrying about making a decision that when you actually make it, you're like, oh, my God, why didn't I do that six months ago? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Oh, yeah. And you can always change again. If, it, if you make the decision and you go, actually, that didn't work, good, you've learned something. Yeah. It didn't work, cross it off, move on to the next. I say this so often to people in business and just in life in general, like you can make a decision today. It doesn't have to be the same decision tomorrow. It's a decision you can either keep making and keep doing, or it's a decision you go, oopsie, fuck that one up. Better do something different tomorrow. Like it's no, it doesn't really matter unless it's something 
life altering or something that's going to majorly affect someone else in your life. It, like it doesn't really matter. Try it. If it doesn't work. That's the worst that can happen. It didn't work. You go and try something else mm. because we're creative people. We, we have more ideas. It's not just like one thing. And if that doesn't work, we'll go and rock ourselves to sleep in the corner eating <laughs> custard or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, um, Leah Kearns, I think was one of the first people who kind of articulated this in my mind is like, everything's an experiment. Your business is experiment, your startup's yeah. an experiment, your life is an experiment. It's all an experiment and nothing really matters. Yeah, yeah, no, she That's talks that. a lot about that and yeah. it's so true. And, yeah. I mean, you look at, we are all, you know, most of our audiences are all um, mostly, you know, women that are doing their own thing. Like we're trying to build something on our own around a whole lot of other commitments. And the fact is sometimes that can feel like, oh, it's not as real as a real business mm. or it's not as real as the, you know, the next Facebook that's building some huge, <laughs> massive software in their mum's garage. Um, and, you know, and that's because the industry is providing so much support and attention to those sorts of companies. Yeah. But the fact is we use all the same methodologies that they use. Like mm -hmm. the whole idea of experimenting and just starting where you are and starting with nothing and bootstrapping, it's all come from them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we take the lessons, I think. We just, like... You don't have to. I think a lot of the building that we tend to do, like the logo, I've got some weird bug flying around my head. Um, <laughs> all the, you know, the logo and the website. I think they're the, they're like the proxy for feeling like I'm really in business. Mm. Because until yeah. we've got money in the door, we none. We feel like we're playing at it. We feel like mm. we're pretending, like we've got dolls in the dollhouse or something playing at, you know, families or something. Yeah. Um, and it's, so I just think it's about recognising that stuff and realising that, you know, you will have to take a leap of faith and you will have to actually have a conversation with somebody and not hide behind a website. And are you up for that? And yeah. the first one will be horrible yeah. and then it gets better after that. Yeah, that's it. And I think, I think exactly like you said, um, a lot of us, I uh, talk about this a lot as well, a lot of people who are uh, now entrepreneurs or starting businesses have come from a background of either corporate or some sort of big business where they have all of that. They've got the infrastructure, they've got the systems, they've got the amazing branding, they've got the marketing, they've got all the different departments like HR and marketing and finance and, and yada, yada, yada. And so we kind of go into this business going, I'm going to do something different. I don't want to go back to my corporate job. And then we accidentally model everything we do on the corporate job. So we accidentally <laughs> think we've got to have the logo, we've got to have the branding, we've got to have the uniform, we've got to have the business cards or no one's going to take us seriously. But actually, um, it's, it's completely the opposite. And I think most people are kind of on board with that, that if you can deliver the thing you say you're going to deliver and if you're showing up and if there's a genuine connection, that's where it sort of starts. I went mm. to a, um, a conference last week and one thing that they talked quite a bit about was sell the thing before you create it, which yeah. traditionally feels really uncomfortable for me because I, like, I kind of, I kind of did that with a course before and it all felt a little bit um, stressful last minute and that sort of thing. But their kind of um, uh, philosophy was test it. Like if you're going to say, I'm going to create this thing, I'm going to write a book or I'm going to uh, make a course or I'm going to do this workshop, mock it up, have a bit of an outline about what the outcomes will be, roughly what the process will be, maybe what some of the inclusions will be and how much it's going to cost and maybe, I don't know, some uh, like a cover or like a mocked up cover or something and test it and say, does anyone want this? It's, you know, I don't know, half price or it's, it's going to be this price or whatever and sell some of them first because A, then you've tested it and people have gone, yep, I want that. Okay, well, you know, there's no point in spending three months creating something if no one wants it, right? Mm. Um, and the next thing is it gives you some sort of accountability and something to kind of live up to because people have gone, yeah, I'll want it and here's some money for it. You've got to create it. It's like beautiful accountability and kind of sense of gentle urgency, I suppose, that kind of creates it. So it's definitely on my um, list of things to get myself over this year is to kind of test those things out and sell before I create um, mm -hmm. the, completely the finished product. So. Yeah. And we all, because if you create the finished product, you become very wedded to the finished product. Mm. If you haven't created it, then you're open to going where the market takes yes. you. And the fact is, for all our 
passion and you can do whatever you want to do. If the market doesn't want it, the market won't buy it. That's right. Yeah. So I, you know, I do think, and I, you know, I'm a, I created all of my things pretty much before I sold them. And I do think it's a particular personality type that that works with. Like, I don't know if you follow Gretchen Rubin, um, but she, the author of the happiness project, I think it was, um, she's got a great podcast called happier. She talks about the four habits tendencies of the way basically everyone fits into one of these four. And most of the population, 70% she reckons fits into I can't know what she calls it, but it's basically the people, maybe it's the obligers, where we respond very well to external deadlines. So if somebody else is expecting something from us, we'll work our butt off to deliver it. But we can't create that same urgency internally. We mm -hmm. don't respect our own self-imposed yeah. deadlines. And so I think that approach works really well for that type of person because mm -hmm. you're effectively creating that external deadline. There's like 10% of the population or something. Right. Just be like, I'm just going to never eat sugar again. And they just never do it. And like, we hate those people. Because yeah, we do. Like, that sucks. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe they can just, you know, they can do whatever they like. Yeah. Um, but it does. I think, you know, if you're a deadline junkie, it's a really good way to do it. But mm. you can, as you say, conduct experiments that gauge interest or pre-sales without, you know, you don't have to deliver it. You can say, I'm selling this mastermind, but say minimum, you know, must reach a minimum number for yes. it to go ahead. Yeah. And if you don't get there or you decide, actually, I don't want to deliver this, then you return the money and you yep. move on with your life. No way um, to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like some entrepreneur dude, I can't remember his name, said like sharpen your offer on the the edge of the market or on the stone of the market or something like that. Mm. And it, that is the truth. Like, and I do this myself. Like, I've got this awesome mastermind that I want to um, deliver this year. And I was talking to my master. I'm in a mastermind. My mastermind coach about it, and she's like, "Well, has anyone bought it?" And I'm like, "Well, I haven't told anyone about it." Yeah. And she's like, "Why aren't you telling anyone about it?" I'm like, "Well, because what if no one buys it?" <laughs> she's like, um, <laughs> "Put the damn thing out there, yeah, and then you will know." And just rather than sitting there with this thing behind the scenes that you're so wedded to, but you don't know if anyone's ever going to buy it, yeah. Guilty. Well, I, we could have exactly the same conversation because that's exactly what I've done in my 12 week thing as well. So, accountability. Oh, yeah, we should make a commitment here that we're both going to put our masterminds out into the world. Right. Let's do it. It's a thing. Let's do it. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now before I completely forget something that I really um, have loved watching the process of from a follower and gigantic Katie White fan is the transformations and changes that have happened in and around your Facebook groups in the last month or so so you just mentioned um, briefly one of them that there's um, a group that you are handing over or have handed over or are stepping away from um, and so there's that but there's also I've really loved your messaging in those groups that sort of says, listen, this isn't working, any suggestions? And then a few weeks later saying, actually, this isn't working and this is, this is the direction we're kind of going to go in now. And a big word for me at the moment is unapologetically. And that's exactly how I feel like you kind of work with, within, your, um, within your groups and that sort of thing, that it's like, actually, I'm doing things a little bit differently and I'm not going to say, sorry, sorry, I'm going to do things differently. I, you know, I know this isn't how, you're actually just saying this is it and this is how it is and I hope that's cool with everyone, but if it's not, that's cool with me as well. Um, you know, and being really kind of unapologetic about not following the herd and, and doing things quite differently to what a lot of other um, Facebook groups are doing. So can you tell us a bit more about that kind of a process and what's happened in that yeah. realm for you lately? Sure. So I, I have two groups. So one is called Empire Builders, although it won't be for much longer. So don't go looking for it in uh -huh. Facebook. Uh -huh. um, and that's the one I launched around, you know, six months into my business. So it's been going for the longest. It's the biggest of the two free groups that I run. <clears throat> it's very much a, you know, more general business group. And it's changed name once, 
so I renamed it Empire Builders late last year. It was called Wellness Entrepreneurs, which you know also aligned with the change of my podcast name and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's got around 1,500 people in it. So it's not small. It grew a lot in that first year to 18 months. Um, and I was, you know, obsessed with it and growing it and things like that. I started a second group around a year ago um, because I just kind of felt like I wasn't able to have the podcasting conversation that I wanted to have. So I started a little one called Podcaster Posse. It's very small. It's grown organically. I've never spent a lot of time on it. Um, it's only about 200 people. And I kind of then, late last year, I went through a rebrand. And after I rebranded, I was kind of like, I feel like I've killed my group, like the engagement had dropped. And what I realized was that I had taken a lot of time out of it. So I had twins last year and I took a lot of time away from my business on and off. Um, and the group was included in that. And that really, I think it felt to me like it really hurt the engagement and the culture of the, not the culture, but the engagement in the group. Mm. Even though whenever I asked people, I would still get loads of people going, oh, it's like my one of my favourite groups. Like I don't, I, maybe it's just a quiet time. I don't really see what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so I kept persisting. And, and look, the thing in my mind was you can't just get, stop with a group like that because it, it's you've done so much work to get it there and you've got all these people and even though I was like, but I'm not selling, like, I'm not selling them anything. I'm not working with them. Why am I doing it? What role is it playing in my business? Mm. Um, and it was more of an ego thing of I've got a group that I've grown to 1,500 people because yeah. it stands for something in this silly online world. <laughs> and so there was a whole lot of ego in there. And then I did, as you said, I tried different things. I asked people um, I changed the name, I changed the theme days and I just kept every couple of weeks, I'd catch myself going, oh, I've got to, I've got to go back and write yeah, something right. in my group today. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, this is not good. This is not how we should feel about our Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. And so I've probably had in my mind this idea of I don't think it's the right group for me anymore for a good six months. Okay. Before I, you know, I did the a video, Facebook Live in there probably a couple of weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, what happened was I listened to a podcast, Everything Comes Back to Podcast, um, where somebody was coaching somebody else on niching. And she, the person she was coaching had just done this hugely brave step to niche so tightly into a tiny corner of the market she'd been in and because I was already thinking about the niching into podcasting and leaving a lot of things behind I was you know you know what it's like you're kind of you hear the message that yeah. you most need to hear yeah. and I heard that and I went right it's time to go yeah. yeah and that was exactly the Facebook live I did I think I called it it's time to go and I just said i it's, it doesn't relate to my business and I believe I don't have enough time to be doing things that are a bit fun. It's got to relate to my business. Yeah, and I, I, yeah. Originally it was my where I found my friends but I've got lots of good online friends now that I see, you know, I come into your group if I want a bit of you or we're in the empire group or the my other, you know, the podcast group. Um, so I kind of, I don't need that anymore. Mm. And it's like, well, I don't have an offer for those people. So I'm not giving them true value. Mm -hmm. So I, it just didn't make sense anymore. Mm. And the minute I made that announcement and was like, well, I can't go back on it now because I've announced it. I felt so light and so much better for it. Yeah. And it's opened up all this opportunity now. Well, well, it will once I transition it to its new leader. Um, watch this space. <laughs> um, it's opened up the opportunity to really spend time on my podcast yeah. group, yeah. which I've never done justice to. And I'm excited about what could happen over there so it's again it's just making the decision mm. given me all the clarity I wanted before I made the decision so exciting and it's so 
um, like, like I said before, it is so liberating when you take the plunge and you're kind of not sure what it's going to look like at the other end, but you do it anyway. And as soon as it's like this energetic thing. And I think the more we start to sort of really feel into that and trust our gut or trust our intuition, whatever you want to call it, the easier it gets to just make those decisions. But the first thousand are really tricky because you've it's like it's kind of a bit scary and it's a bit uncomfortable and like you said you've built up this um group around you and around your style and that sort of thing so people love you and you do feel a sense of obligation to look after them and to deliver to them and to serve them and to give them value um but i mean i tell people all the time you've got to stock take the things you're doing you've got to stock take your business you've got to stock take your offerings you've got to stock take your your Facebook groups. I still take the Facebook groups that I'm active in at least once a month and I'm moving things around between where my priorities are to be posting and to be giving value based on what I am getting out of it. And that's not just sales by any stretch of the imagination. That's probably number five on my list. I like engagement and connection and relationships and professional and personal development above all of those sorts of things. But you can really feel um, a different energy at different times in every different group. Like there's some groups that you'll, you know, have awesome interactions in for a month or something, and then something slightly changes with the dynamic and it goes in a different direction. You think, oh, I'm not, like I'm not really getting anything from that group and it's taking me 15 minutes a week to post every day or, you know, sometimes longer and that sort of thing. And time is really precious. So you've got to be making sure that you're getting things out of groups that you're in as a participant, but also as a business activity you've got to work out what's serving you. I uh, Exactly the same as I was saying before, whether it's a Facebook group that you're curating or it's uh, maybe it's a blog that you're contributing to and it's just taking so much extra time and it's not really giving you any anything, whether it's um, that profiling or sales or leads or whatever. If it's not yielding the thing that you want to yield, find something else. There's no limit to different things that you can be doing or trying or contributing to or experimenting with that will ultimately, you know, help you to hit your goal. And you don't have to be an asshole about it. You don't have to be all, I'm out of this group. I don't want to be part of this, anything like that. There's, you know, an easy and beautiful way of doing it, which is usually just to just do whatever you need to do. Um, but I think it's a really important message overall, not just about, um, you know, Facebook groups and that sort of thing, but to really be very um, uh, clear on where you're spending your time and how much time you have to spend and whether those two things match up and whether they're moving you towards your goals and that sort of thing. So I really love that. I think that's um, awesome. Well mm -hmm. done. <laughs> Thanks. I and, mean, you know, it's, it's hard, it's, but it, nothing feels as hard as it felt before I made the decision. Such mm. an energy suck, worrying and and kind of, you know, because you start forecasting scenarios mm. across every type of decision you could make. When you've just made the decision, you're like, well, now I just have to follow it. See what happens, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I agree with you on Facebook groups. I've been very intermittent in most groups and I found, you know, I don't find that I get direct sales so much from Facebook groups since I've focused in on podcasting because it's such a small segment of people that really are going to be interested in that. But what I, you know, so I am exactly like you said, I've got those first four things I'm looking for that have got nothing to do with sales. And mm. even in the past six months, I've been in a, a US Facebook group and that's not because I'm trying to get US clients. In fact, I couldn't imagine anything worse because I don't want to have to do calls at times that suit the state yeah. because it's ridiculous times here. But what it's giving me is a different perspective because mm -hmm. sometimes I can feel like in Australia, like it feels like I'm talking to all the same people. I'm getting, there's a collective consciousness of yeah. what's going on. And whilst that's a beautiful thing, it can also mean you kind of in a and you need another perspective. So that's what I am using some groups mm. for. Other groups I just find fun. Yeah. Um, and if I'm in a group and I'm like, oh, what am I going to say on that hashtag? <laughs> I never know what to say in this group. Like, hello, time to leave. <laughs> that's right. You don't want to be sitting there agonising about what to say. It should feel like a good fit and like it's an easy place to play in and it's like a Facebook group is essentially an online community. So if they're sort of people or themes or a feel in there that you wouldn't want to hang out with, 
in like over a coffee, it's probably not the right place to be. Like if you're not having some easy conversations and you're going in there and it feels like a chore to go in and do a post and then get out and go in and like something and do a post and get out. Like it's, it's not what it's about, right? It's it. And it feels spammy. Everyone else sees that it's spammy and you don't get any connection anyway. Mm. There's no point. You've got to be so selective about it. Yeah. And you know, I've, this is an evolution as well, right? Mm. Like my views on what, what I like in a Facebook group has completely changed. I used to totally. think I yeah. would always have a promotional day in my Facebook groups because I work with business owners and business owners want to promote their stuff and should be, you know, practicing promoting their stuff. I don't have promo in either of my groups now and I find that a lot of the groups I'm hanging out in don't have promotional days and mm-hmm. I never used to want to hang out in those groups because I'd be like, Oh, you know, it's, but now I'm like, they're the groups I, I kind of yeah. enjoy or I'm in groups that have promo and I usually find I miss promo day, but I'm there on all the other all days. The other ones, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it is a, I think it's a journey thing. It's a stage thing. Yeah. But as you say, like, we've just got to kind of be where we are and be okay with that. Mm. And again, it's not, if you make a decision today, it doesn't have to be the same one tomorrow. There are so many groups that I've been really active in for a couple of months and then completely inactive. And then I've gone back and then I've been really active and what we're like, Mm. it it doesn't have to be a, you know, I haven't been in there for a while, so I'm never allowed to post again or whatever. Um, You know, it's it's not really like that. You follow the energy, you do what you need to do. you, You go where you can give and receive whatever it is that you want to be giving and receiving at that particular time. And that, that's kind of how it works. And I think, you know, we don't really need to be super prescriptive on, on ourselves to say, I have to spend an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon doing my Facebook group posting. Yawn. Mm. Like that's not how it is. If there's a thing you want to be talking about or you've got some time and that's part of your strategy or part of your connection device and how you kind of talk to people, go nuts. But if it becomes a should and a chore, you're in the wrong groups. Mm. Yeah, my favourite entrepreneur group at the moment (laughs) doesn't talk about business. It's all entrepreneurs. No business talk, no promo. Um, It's but it makes me laugh. Yeah, I I can't like hanging out with a big bunch of funny people. People, Um, yeah, and that's like I'm like I always pop in there because there'll be some crazy meme or crazy discussion about something stupid that you get involved in and you're just yep. like, this is ridiculous. But that's the joy <laughs> that I am looking for at the moment. Love it. Yeah, love it. Beautiful. Well, my love, I'm so I'm so stoked that, um, that I know you and that we've um, got so much to do with each other and that I can follow your journey. And I definitely love hearing about All You Capers. I love your messaging. Um, I just love that you totally own the decisions that you make and the things that you do. And chatting with you today has been absolutely gorgeous. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Claire. It's been a joy and, you know, I love that we've been on each other's podcast all inside the same day. <laughs> we, finally, we finally got here. So, Katie, I know that there's some change going around um, names and that sort of thing for your groups and how people can find you, but how can people find you? It'll be in the show notes as well, but how can, we, how can people best work with you and look you up at the moment? Yeah, look, if, if you are interested in podcasting, then the Facebook group is bit.ly forward slash pod posse. But if you just want to see what's going on, check out my podcast, etc., then go to katiewyatt.me and that's kind of the home base where everything else springs from. Fantastic. And I do love your podcast and I love all the things that you do in your group. Um, and if anyone is thinking about doing a podcast, Podwell is the place to go. It's an online course with lots of support and lots of how to's and it goes through everything from aligning the purpose of your podcast and your target audience and your core messages, um, right through to all of the tech stuff and, um, you know, how to actually do it on a weekly basis. So I can't speak highly enough of Podwell and of Katie and, I'm going to stop talking because I'm just going to keep gushing over how fabulous you are. Oh, so. <laughs> thank you, Claire. And, you know, right back at you, I follow you all that all this time as well. So it's a mutual affection oh, and appreciation yay. society we've got going on here. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to talking to you really soon. Thank you. Bye. And that is absolutely it, my lovely. So I hope you've really enjoyed the episode. It was great fun recording that one, as it is with all of them. 
If you'd like to connect, I'd love to stay in touch with you. I have a beautiful Facebook group um, community at bit.ly forward slash The Recovering Perfectionist Crew with all um, capital T, R, P and C. I'm also, I have a massive goal this year to get 50,000 downloads on my podcast and I've got a YouTube show as well. So I'd love for you to help me out if you can by either subscribing to the podcast on iTunes. So if you want to go over and do that now, that would be awesome. If you have a couple of favorite episodes or if there's one favorite episode that you've really enjoyed, I would love you to share that with anyone who you think would get as much out of it as you have as well. And while you're in iTunes, if you can jump in and give it a review, that would be amazing. iTunes definitely helps out podcasts that have got some some good ratings and reviews and some really interactive listeners. So I would really appreciate your help with getting to my goal of 50,000 in 2017. The show is also available over on YouTube. The links are always in the show notes, so you can um, head over there. So it's The Recovering Perfectionist on YouTube. There's a channel for that as well. So jump in and leave your comments. You can watch all of the episodes in video. So if you want to see what we look like and our crazy hand gestures and uh, facial expressions and all of that sort of thing, absolutely jump in. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel show as well. And then you'll be kept up to date when there's some uh, new episodes that come in there. So yeah, love your support. And if you want to shoot me an email, it's hello at clairebarton.com.au. Always happy to receive your emails and yeah, open up a conversation. All right, big love. I'll chat with you soon. Bye.